G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Joe Violetta from Violetta Finance based in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for your time today, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Troy. And I love that you pronounce my name the same way that I pronounce it. And I don't know if it's correct or not, but that's how I pronounce my name, Violetta. Thank you, because I'm always shit scared every time, particularly if there's a European or an Asian name. I'm always worried about mispronouncing it. So <laughs> thank same you. Same here. <laughs> so let's start with how we know each other. Peter, our podcast producer, reached out and asked if you'd come on the show. And tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. So I own a co-owner business called Violetta Finance with my husband, Carl, and it's a mortgage brokerage. Uh, so we're based in Melbourne near the beautiful Mornington Peninsula. And what we do is we help people secure finance for home loans, mortgage refinance, property investment, that sort of thing. Now, Carl's the mortgage broker in the business. I manage our marketing. So that's how yep. we've got our partnership structured. Yeah, great. So you must be very, very busy at the moment. Australia in the last year, particularly, everyone thought property was going to drop 20% in value. You with after COVID, but it's actually gone the other way, and they're now expecting a twenty percent growth in the next two years across Australia. And with the home builder grant and the very very low interest rates, you know, finally younger people can get on the property ladder. So you must be flat out. We are so busy. In fact, we've actually just um, we're just finalising some contracts to bring on another broker into the business, which is super exciting. Uh, last year, we thought it was going to be really quiet. It was a bit quieter, but we had a lot of refinances. The banks came out with some really sweet offers for people to refinance their mortgages. But yeah, you're so right. Like things have just exploded right now. The market is very hot, uh, so we're very busy with purchases. Yeah, that's great. Well, tell our audience how you started out. Okay. Well, so a bit of background. I used to work uh, for the Australian government and I worked in leadership training for um, child support agency, Medicare, Centrelink. So doing their executive training. And my husband, Carl, he actually worked in the fashion industry. So anyone who's met him will know he's a pretty sharp dresser, right? Mm -hmm. So he used to work as an agent between um, distributors, manufacturers and retail stores that um, industry has pretty much died like his old role um, doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. and he saw that industry dying and that role dying so um, he decided he wanted to get into mortgage brokering because he, he had an interest in property so he started the business when I was pregnant with our youngest which is like that's what we do don't we Troy when we're pregnant yep we're about to have kids. We either buy a new house, <laughs> do a major reno or start a new business because heaven knows we haven't got enough going on. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he decided to start a new business. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> Great timing. And I was on maternity leave from my government job. And so I wasn't actually involved in the business at, at the start. It was just Carl and mm -hmm. he was still running his other business as well. But I noticed that we weren't getting any clients. <laughs> He wasn't getting any clients at the start. He was just sitting in the spare bedroom in our house, sort of by himself. <laughs> <laughs> no one knew about him. It was like the best kept secret. So I said, I'm going to give you a hand. I'm going to... Um... So he was shit at marketing, I'm assuming. Oh my gosh. Can I tell you a story? Yes, please do. Yeah. So I said to him, well, you need to market. You need to market this business. And he doesn't like social media or anything like that. And um, he goes, cool, I'll, I'll print out some business cards. I'm like, how are you going to find people to give the business cards to? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's so 1980s. Yeah. It's so 1980s. I said, you need, you need at the very least a Facebook page. So begrudgingly, he set up a Facebook page and he put his first post on there. And after the first post, I said, I'm taking over. <laughs> so the first post, he was at a conference, a mortgage brokering conference. And there, were, there was a cricketer there. Do you follow cricket? I don't. I don't yeah, know. I do. Yep. Okay. I don't know any of the cricketers, but it mm -hmm. was apparently a famous cricketer. He's standing with this famous cricketer and there's a sign behind them. And it said, team player. But Carl accidentally positioned himself in front of the P. <laughs> posted on our Facebook page and I said, you know what? I don't feel like that's going to attract the right kind of 
business for us, like yep. home loan business. So from that moment, I said, I'm, I'm taking over. Yep. Great. And so what year did Carl start the business up? 2014. 2014. Okay, yeah, so great. six years in. Yep. Yeah. And so, and how old were you when the business started in 2014? Well, I'm 42 now. So 42 minus six, 36. Right. So a bit of a, and we're, Carl and I are the same age. So yep. it was quite a bit of a late, you know, a later in, I mean, 36 is still young, but it's a later in life career change. So did you jump into the business in 2014 then or? Yes, I did. Yeah. Right. So yeah, little boy was um, very young, you know, little tiny baby. And I'm like, I'm, I'm jumping in. So I, I was our marketing department, you know, sitting on the couch, feeding a baby uh, on one hand, iPad in the other, trying to um, get some people to know about us. Yeah, great. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business? Yeah, sure. So first year, was pretty much donuts. So mm -hmm. um, no clients really. Carl was very much focused on the, the learning part of the business, like building up his skills. Yep. Um, so we didn't have very many settlements then. From then on, each year, we've made about a 50% growth. Like if you averaged it out, you're yep. looking at year on year increasing revenue by 50%. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, last year was a little bit of an anomaly because, you know, because of COVID. So last year, the business revenue grew by about 30%, mm -hmm. uh, which is still, we're still really happy with that, particularly during um, a pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, as you said, people were predicting that house prices were going to crash, you know, that they were going to fall by 20, 30%. We weren't sure what was going to happen to us. A lot of our clients are tradies yep. and um, or frontline workers, um, not frontline workers, but, you know, people that retail workers, people that hospitality workers, people that need to face to face um, interaction to actually work. So a lot of our clients had um, made purchases or about to make purchases, and then they had to pull out of them at the start of COVID. So the growth was a bit smaller for 2020. But what's really promising now for 2021. So right now, as we're recording this, we're towards the end of February. So we we're you know, two thirds of the way through Q1 for 2021. And uh, we're on track to our revenue to be 40% of what it was last year, just for Q, just in this one quarter. Wow. If you were to extrapolate that, then that's like 160%. That's fantastic. Yeah. If we can stay on track and usually for mortgage brokers, this is what's crazy, right? January is usually really quiet. Yeah. Yep. So um, who knows what the, I don't want to jinx it. I better <laughs> tap on my head and knock yep. on wood, but things are looking all, all right at the moment. And that growth, you measure that in calendar years, not financial years generally. We usually measure it in financial years, oh, yep. um, but for this podcast, I thought I would look at calendar years because um, last year was such an anomaly. I thought it, it would be good to, it just skewed the figures too much looking at, at yep. it in financial years, but usually we set goals based on financial years yeah, and great. measure. Yeah. And any other key numbers, uh, number of team members? So Carl started on his own in the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> what, what FTE are you up to now? So we started at 0.5 yep. because Carl was still running his fashion business mm -hmm. at, at the time. And I mean, I suppose you could add me in, but I wouldn't add me in at the very start. I wasn't on the payroll. Yep. Um, so at the moment, we've got 3.5 FTE on the payroll. Mm -hmm. So we're still keeping things pretty lean. Um, but we do have um, four contractors that um, are not involved in loan processing, but are doing things like virtual assistant work, um, marketing, that sort of thing. So yep. some extra support in there as well. And so those four, what would the FTE be on those, say, two? Um yeah, I would say maybe even closer to one. Yeah. Yeah. So you're at four and a half, but you're about to potentially take on another full-time broker. So you get to five and a half. That's great. Yeah. Great growth yeah. in six years. Well done. Thank you. When was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? Okay. Well, this is a little bit personal, but I'm, I'm happy to share it. Um, when we started the business, like I said, first year was donuts pretty mm -hmm. much. And this is not unusual for mortgage brokers. A lot of people get into the industry thinking it's going to be easy, quick money. It's not. It's very, the first couple of years for most people are very humbling. Yep. Um, you, you're not making a lot of money. 
uh, unless you come from a banking background or you've bought a, a book of loans or, you know, we have none of that and hardly any network as well. And so the first year, especially we were living off savings. Mm -hmm. um, luckily we had a really, you know, we're pretty careful with money. We're pretty savvy. So we had a really nice buffer and also I had um, maternity leave um, yep. as well, but there, there's two moments that we knew that we were successful. One was when I was able to just go do the grocery shop and not have to carry the, you know, my phone calculating <laughs> how much I was spending. Yep. It was just yep. like, you know what? I'm buying the Arnott's biscuits, not the home brand ones. Let's just <laughs> do this. So when, you know, when we weren't sort of counting every dollar. Yep. Um, and then the, uh, another moment where we knew that we were successful where was, I actually have a part-time corporate job now mm. that my son's gone back to school, yep. uh, started school, I should say. And um, I have that part-time corporate job because I love it mm -hmm. and all the money goes into savings. Right. And so it's, a, it, I think to me, success is having choices. Yep. So I do things because I want to do them not because I have to do them. And that, yeah, to me, that's everything. Yeah. Well, that was the next question. What does success look like to you? So it's having those choices and, and flexibility, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Do things because you want to do them. And if you don't want to do them, you can just go, Hey, I'm, I'm just not doing this anymore. Yeah. And that corporate role now, what is that? What field or area is that in? Are you doing it it's in the same industry. Yep. So um, more, uh, mortgage brokers work under aggregators. That's yep. how they get access to all the different banks. And then um, our aggregator has a sub aggregator mm -hmm. uh, that, that we operate under. And so the, the sub aggregator offered me a, a role as their national marketing manager, right. uh, which I was more than happy to take so long as it could be on a part-time basis so that I could also balance Violetta finance and family life as well. I love it. I yeah. love, it's so good. Fantastic. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business. This is your corner. Yeah, I would say you got to get, and this was a game changer for us. You got to get your target audience now down. You got to know who you're talking to mm. because you can't be authentic in your marketing communication. So your emails, your socials, um, your website copy, you can't be authentic if you're trying to talk to everyone. Yep. You've, got, you've got to know who you're talking to. And when we did that, it, it was interesting. I did that and I didn't tell Carl that I was, you know, changing my messaging in the marketing. And he actually, it was, in, it was February, um, it was February four years ago. And he said to me, what has happened? We just have leads flooding in. And I said, I just, I, I nailed down our avatar and, um, and then we, we went through and it to get, you know, to get sharpen your focus and your yeah, coffee. And your exactly. Yep. Yeah. Right. So that would be my, my number one. And then you can get really confident in your own voice. Yep. Great. Mm. And do you have any numbers you track around satisfaction of your customers? Yes. Yeah. So we actually, um, we, we regularly look at our, at our CRM to see, well, where are our leads coming from and what sort of feedback are we getting and that sort of thing? Because you can go kind of on gut feel mm -hmm. and like, oh, well, people seem to be happy, but it's really important to, to dig into the data. And so what we look at is how many, how many clients are we getting as repeat business? So what, what is the percentage of our business that's coming from repeat clients yep. mm -hmm. or referrals from existing clients? Right. And we just had a look at our CRM, you know, in preparation for this podcast and we're sitting at just over 60% of our current business is coming from repeat and referral. So right. wow. that's, that's mm -hmm. great. You know, makes our jobs easier. Absolutely. Um, Do you have a split in that? Do you know what, how much is recurring business coming back or referrals? Yes. So we're looking at about 17% of that 60 is referrals mm -hmm. and then the rest is, is repeat. Wow. 43%. So that's a lot of people buying a new place or an investment property or refinancing. That's huge. Yes. Yeah. So we find, you know, a lot of people buy a house, then within a couple of years, they'll purchase a car. So we can do asset finance as well. And then, um, and then they're refinancing. And then a lot of our, do you know what's so beautiful? A lot of our first home buyers who didn't think they'd be able to buy a house end up buying their first investment property, you know, three, four years after yep. buying their first house, which is just 
crazy. That's I love great. it. Yeah. Now I know you don't use the net promoter score, but I would encourage mm. you to read up on it and, and consider it's just one simple question between zero and 10. How likely are you to refer us to a friend or colleague? I know you've, you've, you've tracked the actual referrals, but it's a really good, uh, simple question to, to, to track or measure customer loyalty. I actually was reading a blog post on your website about, about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is a really good tool, um, or, or, you know, part of our process to, to introduce, because it'd be really fascinating to see. And it, it, I think it's really great to prompt your customers as well to think about that question, because they yeah. might not have realized that you're very open to, to referrals, but asking that question kind of opens up the pathway. So I thought that blog post was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to write another one I've mentioned on this cast before, which is basically exit questions that we ask in a few businesses that I'm involved with. One's accommodation here in the highlands of Tasmania, Australia's oldest golf course. And in that exit email, as soon as someone checks out uh, later that day, they get an email saying, thanks for staying. Um, if you've got any feedback, uh, please click this two minute survey, complete that. And that we ask the net promoter question. We ask for one thing they would change one thing they wouldn't have us change. And then just any other feedback. So it's an open question they can just download, particularly if they're unhappy. And that also blocks a lot of, a lot of negative reviews flowing through to social media because people feel like they've vented. And then we've got the owner's mobile, you know, at the end saying, if you're really unhappy, please call me and I want to hear about it. Oh, I love that. People love to feel heard. So I love that. And I also really like that that it's not an onerous survey. There's only a few questions in it. Yeah. Yeah. And for you guys, also obviously including at the end of that is uh, please do refer us if you know anyone. Mm. Do you already do that at the moment? You've got an exit kind of referral email? Yeah. So we've got an email that we um, send requesting a Google review Mm -hmm. and then asking for them to refer any um, any friends or family. Yeah, then we also follow up within the next six months, just as a, you know, a reminder to please yeah. refer us. And, and that's all automatic in the CRM, I assume? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which platform do you use out of interest? So we're restricted to the CRM that we can use based on our aggregate aggregator. Right. So mm-hmm. we use um, a combination of Podium and Salesforce and they're sort of yeah. bolted together right no salesforce is, is awesome it's mm. a very big piece of software the number one serum in the world but it's also can be expensive for small business so great any other comments on marketing or measuring things yeah i would say so as far as marketing goes if i had any other tips that I wanted to share? It would be, as I said, you know, knowing your audience can help you find your voice. Mm-hmm. So don't be scared to bring some humanity to your marketing. It's okay to be human. It's okay to be a little bit quirky. Um, you don't, you can still be perceived as professional without needing to be a corporate robot. So, you know, just loosen up a little bit and be yourself in your marketing. And also if I could turn back time, if there was one thing I would have done earlier in my marketing, it would have been to get my head around um, my SEO. I only started working on SEO in 2019. I did an SEO course Mm -hmm. and I found that to be a game changer. And I think the thing that held me back was I thought it was going to be overly complicated and I needed like some sort of IT degree or something, but you don't, you you don't need that. You just need um, to access the right information and take action. So I I would have gotten in control of my SEO far earlier. And what was that course called? If you want to shout Uh, out. Yeah, sure. So um, it's actually one of your previous guests. Oh, Kate Toon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to suggest Kate Toon. She's great. Yeah. She's Honestly. Really good. Yeah. She just makes it so accessible for, you know, just normal people like me who are not super technical. Yeah. Just so accessible. What about funding your business? Uh, so we self-funded. Um, we didn't have any investors or bank loans or anything like that. We had uh, really healthy savings and and a healthy buffer as well. And that's how we funded the business. Also, you know, the type of business that we that we 
went into, it doesn't require a huge amount of capital to start. As I said, we started it in our spare bedroom. Uh, you know, you need to pay for your CRM and there's a few startup costs, but it's not, you know, it's not as if you need to pay for a shop front or anything like that. We now have an office, you know, we're co-located with an accountant and we moved into an office quite quickly, but um, yeah, it was self-funded. Yeah, great. And if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Yes, yeah, definitely. I think this is an amazing industry to be in. Uh, what you can do for people, like seeing someone who thought they couldn't buy their first home and then being able to buy their first home. And then, like I said, a few years later, seeing them becoming a, a, a property investor yeah. is like it honestly gives me goosebumps and I know it does for Carl as well. And there's so much opportunity in this industry as well. And can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey? So our audience can learn from it. It was definitely at the start, you know, when we were living off savings and we weren't making very much money and that there come moments where your faith is shaken and you're sort of like, Oh my gosh, have we done the right thing? Mm. Are we, are we going to be okay? But I believe in my husband, Carl, and he believes in me. And I just felt like if any two people can make this work, it's, it's us. We just need to, we just need to keep going. And, and one other really stressful time was, you know, we're a husband and wife team working together and we live together and we work together. Yep. <laughs> and Carl is quite, he reminds me of you. He's quite, he's quite, quite chill, you know, and uh, you are quite chill. You seem to be. <laughs> Some days <laughs> when I've had enough coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's pretty, he's a pretty relaxed guy and I'm quite an intense person and I'm quite, um, spontaneous. Um, whereas he's, he's quite methodical. He thinks about things and I get very excited. And so I was a bit full on at the start. Like when I started working in the business, I was so keen to make this thing happen that I wouldn't stop talking about business yep. all the time and ideas and like pushing <laughs> him to do all this exciting stuff. And, um, um, he ended up just having to say to me, babe, we've got to have some time where we're not talking yeah. about business. Very important, when, especially when you work together in the business. Mm. And, it, and it's quite common. I, I was certainly did it at the start of my business career 21 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you know, thinking about business outside of work hours, uh, weekends, holidays, and obviously talking about it a lot as well, which pissed off a lot of girlfriends. Uh, who, who weren't in the bis small business circles. So yeah, it's really important to put those boundaries in place and just, you're not going to lose all those ideas, all that energy. You just need to cap it and, and turn it back on when you're at the desk next time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I think it's really about time management. That has been one of the biggest challenges for myself um, and for Carl as well, is for me having all these ideas and not knowing how to, having to learn how to prioritize them. And for Carl, it's, it's been having all these demands and having, you know, people uh, trying to grab your attention all the time, phone calls, emails, whatever. Um, and how do you structure your day so you're actually getting the work that needs to get done rather than reacting? So time management mm. has been a huge learning curve for me, especially coming from working for government where things are sort of somewhat structured for me yeah. to um everything's boundless. It's yes. like everything's boundaryless. I need to create the boundaries. Yeah. And mm. how did you get around that? Did you find a tool that you use to help you put everything together and in order? What I, yeah, what I found has really helped me is so two things. The whole team uses Asana, which mm -hmm. is an online project management tool yep. so that's helped us to prioritize tasks and also for me the pomodoro method yep. so that's where you work intensely for 25 minutes mm -hmm. and then you take a five minute break and then you go back again and it's intensely on one task not yep. jumping around from from task to task it's very important have you read cal newport's book deep work 
Everyone is telling me I need to read that book. Right now I'm reading James Clear Clear's um, Atomic Habits. Yes, I'm, I'm halfway through that one myself, actually. <laughs> I wonder if we're up to the same bit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Deep Work, everyone, I've heard lots of people have told me I need to read that. So, um, yeah, Could better do it. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? Matt, so the thing I've enjoyed least is the, again, it's, it's to do with time and it's juggling, it's juggling the, the hours because we, there's always work to be done. And so we could be working all day, every day into the night. Yep. And so it's, again, it's like, how do we put those boundaries? Because you know, you get into small business. One of the reasons you get into small business is so you can have the kind of lifestyle that you want and that balance, but it can be easy to lose that balance. So um, it's being able to look after our, ourselves um, and, you know, me look after myself, can't look after himself uh, physically and mentally um, while still having a really fast growing company. What do you love most about growing a small business? For me in my role, it's, that I can unleash my creativity. No one tells me what I can and can't do apart from, yeah, you know, I've got to be compliant and that yes. sort of thing. Yep. But you know, I, I can, I, I set my diary, which can be a problem as well. Um, I set my projects and I, yeah, I can do whatever I want. And I love that. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Biggest mindset. This is something that we're looking at this year and it's, and it's around that we don't have to be seven, eight, whatever figure entrepreneurs that yep. success isn't necessarily a dollar figure. And, you know, we've had great growth and we've added more to our team, but it's the mindset is success really is about choices, as I was saying before, and freedom. And so it's about being okay with not growing to, you know, having 10 brokers under us or something yep. like that. It's growing to a point where, like I said, we can buy the brand name biscuits and we can go on holiday when we're, you know, when we're able to. Yep. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? So <laughs> it's going to sound cheesy, a self-care <laughs> habit. Yep. Get up early, go to bed early, get up early, meditate, um, set your intention for the day and exercise. And that is going to give you a successful business. It, it really is. It'll flow through th to the rest of your day. You can tell I've been reading that Atomic Habits book. Yep, <laughs> but it'll, yeah. And then you're in control of what's going on. And, and, you know, going back to mindset, that being in control is another one of the, the big mindset shifts, not letting your life and your day run away. Be the change you want to see in your business. Become more productive and less stressed with our free Transform Your Performance online course. Once you see the benefits, put your entire team through the course at no cost. We start out by telling you the secret to guaranteed success. Then over 100 lessons help you be more focused, present, productive and feel more in control about work. Growasmallbusiness.com Can you talk to how you've added people to the team? Some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Yeah, definitely. So um, we engaged a HR consultant for our very first hire. Um, yes, it's an extra expense, but it is so very important to get everything set up correctly. Uh, and it was really important that um, I, I, I involved myself in the process because it was really important to me that our hiring process and our working conditions were really inclusive, especially for women. So we have a breastfeeding policy. Um, we have generous, you know, flexibility for parents and, and that sort of thing. So I would say if you want to get results through people, you need to you need to work in the spirit of reciprocity and and really value your employees and offer flexibility. Yeah, did that HR consultant help you in the actual recruitment of that first person, or just setting everything up and helping you define the process and the questions and vetting and stuff? 
she helped us, yes, with the contracts, defining the roles, that sort of thing. But um, we we actually did the recruitment ourselves. Yep. Um, working for the government, I had had some experience in that area around, um, you know, how to interview effectively and that sort of thing. So yep. I, I pulled in those skills. That's good. Very smart. I highly recommend businesses get a HR consultant in, an expert to, to review at the very least all your HR compliance and what you've got set up and help you you know uh, with your induction checklist and all, all the stuff that's not compliant wise but it certainly helps create that great first impression with the new team member um, but yeah generally I, I don't advise to use them as part of the recruitment but everything else around that to help you get the process to find correctly the right questions to ask how to design behavioral based questions etc et so a HR expert certainly is, is well worth it absolutely what are some of the things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? So again, definitely that spirit of reciprocity, um, you know, flexibility. I believe in servant leadership. So as a leader, I believe that my role is to empower my staff to enjoy their role and do the and get the most out of it for for themselves and have that feeling of, of accomplishment and achievement so my job is to make their job easier and better and then um, I reap the benefits as the leader as well and tell our audience how you've handled balance <laughs> still handling it <laughs> still try, trying to handle it so definitely the early mornings have helped yep. um, so getting up early and just having some time for myself and you know again because I work with my husband uh, having really frank conversations uh, open communication also you know again from the husband and wife working with your partner perspective um, we have very distinct roles in the business so I look after marketing he looks after the actual um, client uh, interactions and, and relationships and so not kind of muddying the waters too bit too much helps um, yeah and then also just making sure that like I said before you've got times where you're not talking about business yeah. mm. and how much professional development have you invested in yourself Heaps. I'm a big believer, so is my husband, Carl, in continuous learning and yep. continuous improvement. So, um, you know, I did the SEO course. I've done other marketing courses as, as well. Um, I've got a, a mentor. Carl has a coach. Um, we need to do, you know, continuing professional development to, to he needs to anyway, to remain um, licensed and yes. qualified, mm -hmm. but um, we do so much more on top of that as well. Formal and informal. Yeah. And mentors and coaches. So maybe tell the audience about that experience, value they've added, and what areas they've helped you in. Yeah. Cause there's a difference between a mentor and a coach, mm -hmm. isn't there? Yeah. Because a mentor has, kind of walked the path that you've walked before and can give you guidance and advice. This is how I see it. Whereas a coach may have walked the path that you've walked before, but they're really good at drawing out expertise from you by asking really smart questions. Yep. Uh, and, you know, you can get a bit of a crossover between the two, but what I've found it for me, I needed a mentor and I've found um, that that has helped me to know where to focus my efforts and my, and my energies. Um, it's been really beneficial. I think if you are wanting to grow and scale a business, you need some outside guidance. Yeah. You can't, cause you're, cause you're in it. So you can't see it. Absolutely. Mm. What about a board of directors or advisors? Do you have that at the moment? No, we, we're not structured in that way. Um, we work, at, so as far as our finances go, we're structured as a family trust, yep. but yeah, no. Great. Final five questions, Joe. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Time management. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? I uh, like, uh, it's years ago, I read a book called Marketing to Mums by Kat uh, Katrina McCarter, and mm -hmm. I thought that was fantastic. Oh, good. Haven't heard that one. Yeah, it's a good one. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Um, so I am part of the Digital Masterchefs uh, group 
And so there are lots of masterclasses and that, that sort of thing. So I try to just focus on one place to get my information or else I get a bit confused. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, diet and exercise advice. It can get really confusing. Overwhelming. So, yeah. 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 One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business. I think Asana is great. Yep. Yeah. Final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? You've got this and you will be able to buy the expensive biscuits one day. <laughs> I've never heard anyone describe it that way. It's great. Well, thanks for your time today, Joe. I think the audience will get a lot of value out of uh, what you shared with us. Um, terrific journey. Congratulations to you both on getting the business uh, now from half a FTE to probably five and a half people full time in the next uh, you know, near future. So thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me on, Troy. It was a lot of fun. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 